sleeping. He slept all the time. I thought it might be smoking a lot of weed. He wasn't smoking a lot of weed. He was just dying right in front of me, and nobody could figure out what it was. And I went to a class very similar, uh, a two-day seminar about sleep apnea, down in Irvine, taught by this company that I truly believe in now. And uh, after a couple hours of sitting in that class, I was in the back row bawling the whole ugly cry thing. And the dentist asked me, you know, what is, what's going on? So I really told him, I said, everything that you talked about, literally, I think you're describing my son. He said, the one question that no one ever asked him, in all of his, all of his medical visits, the one question nobody ever asked him is, do you snore when you sleep? He said, does he snore when he sleeps? Oh, yeah, like a freight train. I'll tell you what his problem is. He's got a sleep disorder breathing problem. So we took him home. I went home with a, on a mission and did a sleep study for him. And Michael, my son, became my first patient. I changed my career from that point forward to make sure that I can help dentists and help patients find out this life-threatening and life-shortening disease in the third grade instead of in their third year in college. If I can, if I can spread the word and help you as dentists help other patients, what a gift that is for our community and the health of our community. So that's why I do what I do. Um, I started in, in Arkansas with a little practice and built it up to where we, you know, it's a, a million dollar sleep practice now. I'm very, really proud of it. A few years ago, Sleep Group Solutions asked me, can you please help us help other dentists with the protocol that you use? And so I've been traveling with with Sleep Group Solutions and teaching as many dentists to listen to me so that I can help you help your patients. It's really our first time that we can truly save someone's life. I mean, what good are beautiful teeth and, and healthy periodontia if they go home tonight and have a stroke and you were looking at what caused it and didn't say anything? So I really want to give you a little taste of kind of a, a brief introduction into what the kind of care that we in the dental field can give patients who have sleep-related breathing disorders and kind of a protocol that really works to make it flow through your practice. It, this isn't Zoom and it's not six-month smiles. It's not something that we add on. It, this has to become how you do dentistry. We kind of have to begin to treatment plan patients from the airway forward, not just from the teeth back. Because every change we make to a patient's occlusion, as little as a half a millimeter, can have a dramatic impact on their airway. So I want to kind of raise your awareness of what you're already looking at, and let's let's see patients differently. Okay? So that's me. That is my personal phone number. If you know any really you know nice single guys, no, just kidding. Um, but that's also my, uh, my email address. You're more than welcome to uh, email me or call me or text me. I'm glad to help you and your patients any way I can. So Sleep Group Solutions started in 2005. It's a small privately owned company from, from Hollywood, Florida. Uh, began in a closet, a little bitty building, and now we have a, a large uh, office in Hollywood where we have a full center of care for, for dentists, a whole team, a great big team of people to wrap around you and your dental practice to help you be successful with this. We own the technology uh, called EchoVision. And EchoVision is, think of it like an apex lo locator for your airway. It is a technology that allows us with acoustics to actually measure the airway cross-sectional diameter to, and then measure the airway in collapse. So we actually can see the airway change in real time. So it allows us to be able to measure airway and actually find treatment position for an oral device and take a bite at the proper treatment position rather than just guessing a spot and praying you get there without culling them. So that's what Echo Vision is. I'll show you that, guys, in a, in a little bit. But it is the world's largest dental sleep medicine education company. Uh, it has everything. It's the only company that really has the whole picture where we do education, technology, protocol, support, everything that you need. So let's start with the test. So raise your hand and leave it up. 
Not right yet. You have to answer yes first. But I bet you're going to answer your yes to one of them. Okay. If you snore, who snores? How about anybody clench or grind your teeth? How about suffer from morning headaches? Have high blood pressure? How about acid reflux? How about carrying a few? Okay, I'm out, of, I'm out of hands. How about carrying a few extra pounds, a few dozen pounds? How about having a spouse that does any of those things? So if you raised your hand at any time, raise your hand and look around. So if you put your hand up, that's almost all of us. Those are all signs and symptoms of an airway problem. It's that easy to find patients. So what do these three guys have in common, you guys? What do we see? They're all big guys, okay? Chad, Justin, and Mike. Uh, Chad's a hip hop, hop artist, and Justin is on the, that show um, on A&E, The Deadliest Catch, you know, where they're catching those crab. That's his job. Mike's an MMA fighter. So all of these guys are in their mid-30s. All of them are overweight. They're big guys. They all have a neck circumference of 17 inches or more. All of them have been diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea. And all of them are dead. You're not supposed to die in your 30s of a heart attack. So those are complications that we see. And more and more we're beginning to hear about people who die of problems that is a complication of sleep apnea, just a Scalia. Reggie White, Princess Leia, died of complications from obstructive sleep apnea. So we got to know our enemy. What is obstructive sleep apnea? Obstructive sleep apnea is one of the most common sleep disorders. And it's a condition where your airway, the lumen of your airway, isn't, doesn't have enough integrity of itself to hold itself open when you go to sleep. So when you go to sleep and the muscles in your, air, in your airway area relax, the airway collapses and restricts our ability to get air into our lungs. That's what obstructive sleep apnea is. One out of every three patients has this in the United States. One out of every three, it's that common. So this is what it looks like. I hope you guys can see this. Oh, no sound. This man's in a sleep lab, and he's actually all wired up. He's got electrodes on his head. He's got, uh, he's got a nasal cannula to monitor his breathing. These are called effort belts, and these belts are on to, to monitor his effort to breathe. No sound. There you go. All right. All right. He's trying to breathe. Watch. He's trying to breathe, but he can't. The muscles are relaxed. The airway is blocked off with his tongue and his soft tissues. So now there's a choice. Wake up or die. Oh, good. Okay, so he woke up. So he's had an arousal. He's come out of the stage of sleep, recaptured his control of his airway, but now he's going to relax again, go back to sleep, and we're going to start all over again. So that's the pattern of sleep apnea. So he's still working on breathing. How rested do you think he is? You know, if you do that one or two times a night, yeah, that's not so bad. You can tolerate that. But if you're doing that, 20 times an hour. Can you imagine the impact that that has on our cardiovascular system, on our mental health when we're not getting any rest at all? He's still not breathing. Oh, okay. All right, he didn't die, thank goodness. So that's what it looks like. And these episodes can be short. They can be as short as a few seconds, but they can be also really long. I have my assistant in Florida, uh, sweet little girl, 
I uh, was going to lunch one day, and I st she was coming out of her car, and I always thought, she's a little bitty tiny thing. I thought, oh, she likes to work out. So I thought, oh, did you go over to Orange Theory? I thought she'd gone across the street to Orange Theory working out. No, no, I have to take a nap in the afternoon. I take a nap in my car at lunchtime, because if I don't, then I don't have enough energy to drive home. But we're in, in Miami. I think it's, it's as bad as San Francisco. It's like the 405 all the time. They think I-95 means that's how the speed limit. So she couldn't drive home without getting sleepy, so she took a nap every day. I'm like, seriously, darling, have you not met me? That's what I, you know, why, if you're that tired, we need to look at you. So I did a sleep study on her, and she choked seven times an hour. And she's like, oh, that's not so bad. Your shortest event was two and a half minutes long. She's 21 years old. No wonder she can't, ha, doesn't have enough energy to go home. So these can be very short or they can be really long, but they typically happen hundreds of times a night. And interrupt your sleep. There's two parts of, of sleep apnea that, that really wreak havoc on our systems. One is the fact that our oxygen saturation drops while we're not breathing. But the other is the impact that, of that constantly being awakened over and over and over does to our hormonal system. So we'll talk about that briefly. So apnea actually means you're suffocating. You're not, he's not, this, he wasn't holding his breath. He wasn't stopping breathing. He was literally being suffocated by his tongue. When you, when you stop breathing, that doesn't scare you. It doesn't cause you anxiety or, or adrenaline rushes. But when you are being suffocated, it does. So this is being suffocated. When you go to sleep at night you're, and your conscious brain, conscious brain turns off, it doesn't know. It can't tell the difference between a burglar choking you and your tongue choking you. So it has to respond the same way with fight or flight. Wake up, get out of the situation, regain your ability to breathe, whatever it takes. So you're suffocating when you have apnea. Sleep apnea, of course, means that you're suffocating during sleep. Obstructive sleep apnea is what we can fix. It means your body is choking on itself, um, your tongue, soft tissues, adenoids, all the way, can be all the way down your airway. There's another apnea, central sleep apnea. It's, it's a neurological condition. Uh, central sleep apnea is when your brain actually forgets to tell you to breathe. So in the video where you'd see the guy making the effort, his belly was working, pull, trying to pull air in past it, that does not happen in central sleep apnea. Your brain just forgets. You don't even try. So obstructive, that's our wheelhouse. Central, we can't handle that. That's a neurological. We'll send them back to a sleep lab. So what do we do about it? We can... Put a CPAP on you and blast your airway open all night long with air. It's just not very comfortable. CPAPs work. CPAP has always been the gold standard of care. So over the years, that's been the direction that medicine has always pushed patients is to try the CPAP. And really what it does is just blow the air open like you're driving down the highway. It's very effective. It works almost 100% of the time. But the unfortunate part is that many patients cannot tolerate it. More than half, 50 to 70% of patients who get a CPAP won't or can't use it. So no matter how good the therapy is, if you can't use it, it doesn't do us any good. So that's how we've always fixed it before. So now other treatments, including oral devices and some surgeries are out and available now. We've gotten really good at them in the dental field. So having an alternative to this care is really important for patients. So CPAPs come in all shapes and sizes. Nose, some just cover the nose. Some, that looks so sad, uh, cover the whole face. I actually have had a patient in that mask. That mask is made to combat claustrophobia. Right? <laughs> no. Nasal pillows. Full face masks, not real sure what's in that glass. But uh, they've tried all sorts of shapes and sizes. But in comparison, patients really prefer oral devices if they can wear them because there's nothing blowing in their face. It's 
nothing t tethered to them. They don't have any cables around their face, no hoses, no cords. So, yeah, there's a huge market for it for patients who are non-compliant or intolerant of that. So how many people are there with this? How common is it? If all the people who currently have sleep apnea are the whole pie, only the slice that's pulled out are the people who've been lucky enough for their doctor to actually say something to them and get a sleep study done. And of the patients who've been lucky enough to do that, only the little blue sliver are the patients who have been adequately, adequately treated. So one-tenth of the patients who have this problem currently are being, have been diagnosed and only a quarter of those have actually been treated. So we have a huge population of people who have this life-threatening, life-shortening disease who are inadequately treated for it. Less than 10% of patients have been. How common is it? 18% of men and 8% of women until the time of menopause. So it's, when we, when we look at men, men to women, uh, it's seven to one men to women until women hit menopause and then it's two to one. So it's much more common in men, um, especially in the younger years. So we don't wanna miss any of our young guys that are getting diagnosed. So it's not just snoring. It's not just the noise. The noise is bad, but that noise symbolizes a body function that is life-threatening. We know that 80% uh, of nighttime strokes are directly attributed to obstructive sleep apnea. There's also been a real strong link, research just recently, connecting the act of snoring, just snoring to stroke, not even sleep apnea, snoring itself. So snoring is bad. It's not normal, and 70% of the time it indicates that there's an airway problem. So the one most important thing that I can ask you to please at least do for your patients is make sure that you ask every patient, has anyone ever told you that you snore when you sleep? That truly can save a patient's life because most patients have never had anybody ask them. There's nothing, there's nothing that's cooler in, the, in my experience so far than a patient coming back to me after we've helped them get a sleep study and some therapy and they're feeling better. They come back and just say, how did you know? How did you know? I, I've been everywhere trying to find that. Nobody ever could figure it out. How did you know? I, it was all about the snoring. You know, it's all in your airway. So it really is a great way for us to help patients with something that nobody else has helped them. But we can't just treat snoring. Glidewell makes the little silent night. Has anybody made a silent night appliance? Right. So did you get a sleep study done for your patient before you did it, or did we just turn off the snoring? Yeah. It's really dangerous to do that because snoring is what's telling us something's wrong. And we really need to have a sleep study done for a patient and an MD to tell us that they only snore so that we can treat that appropriately. So it's really important that we don't just turn off the noise without knowing if there's an underlying disease that goes with it. Super important because we can create a silent apnea in a patient, make them quiet, but they're still choking and suffocating on themselves and still at risk for a heart attack and stroke. So you have to be really careful with that. It's like taking the batteries out of your fire alarm. You make it stop making noise, but you forget to put out the fire in your house. So we really have to be very careful with simply just treating snoring. If a patient comes in with a complaint of snoring or asks for help, we really need to get a sleep study done for those patients to make sure that we know what we're really dealing with, okay? Some of the facts. OSA is one of the most life-threatening and life-shortening disease processes there is. It's comprised of two main events. An apnea, which means no air moves at all, and a hypopnea, which is a partial apnea, where the airway is occluded enough that you're unable to exchange oxygen appropriately. Oxygen saturation drops, arousal occurs. So for both apnea and hypopnea, each of those events has to be at least 10 seconds long. They can be minutes long, but 10 seconds at its minimum. Hypopnea is also accompanied by at least a 4% decrease in oxygen saturation. So there's some really strict parameters about what guidelines we use to say what's an apnea, what's a hypopnea, and how they're counted when we're looking at a medical field. All of that's been set up by insurance companies, which are not my favorite people, but 
insurance companies put guidelines about what, how we can call what it is. So, apneas and hypopneas together make up what sleep apnea is. A single episode can last minutes, but at its minimum, it has to be at least 10 seconds long. It is the not-so-silent killer. We know that one of the main uh, symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea is snoring, loud snoring. Um, this is a, a big study uh, done in India with, with uh, an Indian, Dr. Punjabi did it at John Hopkins, and uh, in this study it shows that 46% more likely to die of any cause if you have untreated severe sleep apnea. So mostly men, but you're 46% more likely to die of anything. The only, way, the only way you could get out of that study was to die. So we know that it leads to a lot more problems of any problems, a car accident, heart attack, stroke, uh, Alzheimer's disease, getting hit by a bus, any, any reason you're more likely to die if you have obstructive sleep apnea. So how do we diagnose this? When a patient has a sleep study done, it's the only, really, the only way to really diagnose obstructive sleep apnea is to have a sleep study done. It can be done with a home sleep study or it can be done in a lab with a polysomnogram. It doesn't matter how you get a sleep study done. But that's the way we quantify what's going on. So what they do is take a sleep study and then they'll look at every minute of your sleep. And they'll look at every time you have a com an apnea, so no breathing at least 10 seconds. And they'll look at every time that you have a hypopnea, partially not breathing for at least 10 seconds with a big decrease in oxygen saturation. And they'll add those two numbers together and divide it by the number of hours that you slept. So apneas plus hypopneas divided by your hours of sleep is called the apnea hypopnea index. That's the gold standard. The AHI is the gold standard for how they diagnose obstructive sleep apnea or quantify it. So if you choke five to 15 times an hour, that's considered mild. 15 to 30, 15.1 to 30, is considered moderate sleep apnea, and over 30 choking events an hour is considered severe. So mild, moderate, and severe. That's for insurance, because those numbers are so poorly, that's so skewed. I never say mild, moderate, and severe to patients. You either have sleep apnea or you don't have sleep apnea. You're positive or you're negative. It's not, you're not mildly or moderately pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not pregnant. You either have sleep apnea or you don't have sleep apnea. So we have to be really careful with these. Patients who have, unfortunately, who get diagnosed with mild, where are you? I j you. The, get diagnosed and they say you have mild sleep apnea. And we think that's, what, when we hear mild, that means, hey, that's not so bad. So I should be good, right? I don't need any help. I probably don't need anything because it's just mild. It's like a mild rash. It's not mild. I have, like my little girl in Florida, her score was seven. She, had, she was like, wow, cool, it's just mild. I think it'll be all right. But if your events are two and a half minutes long, how is that mild? You can have a patient who has a score of 30, and their events are 10 seconds long, Who's, their oxygen saturation doesn't go far as, as down as low. The little girl in, my little girl in Florida's oxygen saturation went down into the 70s. You know, you can have a, a score of 30 really short ones and not nearly be as sick as a patient with mild. So these numbers are really, have nothing to do with how sick patients are. These numbers only have to do with whether your insurance company is going to pay for your care or not. This is a medical protocol, and everything we do for patients in this protocol is billed to their medical insurance. None of it's billed to their dental insurance. So we have to kind of go by the medical rules, and that, unfortunately, is what we have right now to deal with in the medical rules, okay? Oxygen saturation is a main part of OSA. Every time we choke, we stop exchanging oxygen to carbon dioxide. So our oxygen level starts to fall. And once our oxygen saturation gets to 92, who does sedation in here? Anybody? 92, oxygen saturation goes, we put on oxygen or wake them up, right? Once we hit 90% oxygen saturation, cells start to die. 
If you're in the hospital, they come in and put on an nasal cannula and give you supplemental oxygen at 92. The problem with patients who have OSA is there's nobody to come in and put oxygen on you and help you if you can't breathe overnight. So you're hours and hours with low oxygen saturation, and that has a dramatic impact on cellular health. So once things die in certain organs, you don't get them back. Brain, pancreas, kidneys, very unforgiving. Once those cells die, they're gone. So very common to see strong hypoxemia in patients. So what are the most common signs and symptoms? The most common, three most common signs and symptoms for obstructive sleep apnea are snoring, excessive daytime sleepiness, and hypertension. Other symptoms that are included in this, and I really feel like number four should be acid reflux, but acid reflux should be over here. Acid reflux, uh, morning headaches, type two diabetes, social problems, depression, anxiety, memory problems, Alzheimer's disease, and the dementia spectrum. Uh, dental symptoms, and we'll talk about those too. And then nocturia, having to get up in the middle of the night and go to the bathroom. Or children went in the bed. All of these we see in this. Things that contribute, of course, being big doesn't help, but, but being chubby does not cause this. You're born with this. This is genetics. It's not, about, it's not about how big or little you are. Uh, menopause, once we lose our estrogen girls, we become more testosterone filled. And once we, estrogen is airway protective. Estrogen is smooth muscle protective. So once we don't have the, our estrogen supply, then our airway is no longer protected like it was when we were young, having, in childbearing years. Uh, and of course, mouth breathing and a family history of sleep apnea. So snoring, why is snoring a symptom? Because the air, snoring occurs when the airway begins to collapse. So I, I tell patients this, you're, we either are born with one of two kinds of airways. If you are healthy, you're born with an airway that's very much like a garden hose. It's reinforced, it has enough integrity to hold itself open. So whether the water is on or off, it still looks like a garden hose. You have to, pretty firm. A healthy airway should be just like that. When you go to sleep and breathe out and relax, it shouldn't squish down. Unfortunately, a third of us are born with airways that are like fireman's hoses. So when you turn off the water, they fold flat. When you breathe out, the airway follows the air. And that's very much what we're looking at. So when the airway begins to collapse, just like if you put your thumb over the end of the garden hose and occlude it, the water sprays faster. When, you, when your airway begins to collapse, the air moves faster. And that faster moving air causes turbulence. And the turbulence makes the tissue vibrate. And that's the sound of snoring. So you don't snore unless you have a collapsing airway. So that's why it's the number one symptom. It's not just about, ha-ha, funny, you're making a bunch of racket. It really, truly is about your airway collapsing and starting to cause a problem. So, of all the people, asking patients if they snore is life, life-saving. So, let's make sure that if nothing else we do, if we see signs and symptoms in the mouth, and we'll look at those in just a minute, then we make sure to ask the patient that one question. It doesn't take that much time. Who's the hy who's hygienists in here? I know I saw, yes. There is no one who spends more time, more often, with a patient in any healthcare field than a hygienist does. You spend more time than any medical professional. So your ability to save someone's life is in your chair. So I really encourage my hygienists to do not just oral cancer screening and not just periodontal screening, but to do an airway screening and really look past the molars and just say what you see. You can save a patient's life, truly, in your chair. That's so powerful. It's a hygienist saved my kid. So a lot of times when we're in the chair and we ask those questions, you get the, uh, no, well, I don't, but my husband does. There's nobody that will throw you under the bus faster than the person you have to sleep with. So... Having a bed partner involved in this is really important. And bed partners can really be our eyes and ears. Having 
having to sleep with someone uh, who snores can lo make you lose hour or more of sleep a night. The second most common symptom, excessive daytime sleepiness. So remember in the video, when the guy's choking, 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 and then he has that arousal, not the good kind, and he wakes himself up and catches his breath. If he does that over and over and over, he never gets through the stages of sleep that the body so desperately needs to have energy and be healthy. So if he's always, so think of your sleep like a, like a roller coaster where we have different phases of sleep that do different things for our body. Deep sleep and REM sleep. And if you don't ride that roller coaster all the way around for at least four trips, because each trip is 90 minutes, your body doesn't get the nourishment that it needs. All the good things that happen to us happen when we're asleep. Our hormones reset, our immune systems reset. Everything good happens to us in sleep. So we need certain periods of the night and certain stages of sleep to really be physically healthy so that we can do what we need to do during the day. So if you fall, if you're on that sleep slide and you choke, you literally fall off. You have to start over at the top. You don't get to start over where you left off. If you choke on the slide, you just go back to the top to stage, first stage of sleep and start over. And you might fall off once or twice, that's not a big deal. But if you never get all the way through a sleep pattern because you're constantly you know, 30 or 40 times an hour choking and waking up, the impact on your hormonal system is devastating. So excessive daytime sleepiness shows. How many of us have patients that fall asleep in the chair? You guys have sharp, pokey stuff. We, the, the dental chair is not the place you should be sleeping. So how many of us have patients who fall asleep, uh, have had car accidents and, and fallen asleep in their car? I want to die the way my grandfather did, peacefully in his sleep, not scared and screaming like the passengers in his car. The number one cause of fatal car accidents is sleepy driving. Not drunk driving, not texting and driving, sleepy driving. When you fall asleep and you're driving, you wake up in the crash. So it's very, very deadly. A uh, 12-fold increased risk of, of uh, automobile accident when you have obstructive sleep apnea. So really important. Uh, and we see it all the time. That's that big train that ran up the escalator in, in Hoboken, New Jersey, killed a whole bunch of people. Uh, he didn't remember the crash. They diagnosed him with obstructive sleep apnea. That's the, the uh, train wreck of the Metro North. It's all, this, it's all the East Coast folks. I'm pretty sure it's not y'all. So, um, but he had severe sub obstructive sleep apnea. He was not being treated, fell asleep, crashed the, crashed the train. The um, Walmart truck, because you know I'm from Arkansas. So the Walmart truck that ran over Tracy Morgan's car fell asleep when he was driving, just didn't hit him. So it's really important that we help on, with the highways that we all have to travel, it's really important for patients to drive and sleep safely. So, number three, hypertension. How many patients did we see this week who were on antihypertensive medications? A bunch. Third most common symptom is hypertension. Why do patients have hypertension with OSA? Every time you, you choke, every time you choke, your body has a sympathetic response to that, fight or flight. So every time you choke, you get this lightning rod burst of adrenaline to your heart, which contracts the heart, up goes your heart rate, up goes your blood pressure. And over time, your body begins to accommodate and leave it up. The second, most con the re the second reason that we have um, hypertension is because habitually, people who have obstructive sleep apnea tend to breathe more through their mouths instead of through their nose. And the turbinates in our nose, in our, in our nasal sinus area, is where nitric oxide's built. And if we don't breathe appropriate amounts through our nose, we're nitric oxide deficient. And niso, nitri, uh, nitric oxide is our vasodilator. So if we don't have a vasodilator, then we are vasoconstricted. And a smaller pipe makes a higher blood pressure. So patients who are on more than one blood pressure medication, how many patients did we see this week who were on lisinopril and hydrochlorothiazide? Losartan and hydrochlorothiazide. Those duplicate, those dual medications like Hyzar, 
those are the patients that we really need to look for airway problems. Research says that patients who take more than one blood pressure medication are, are 83% 83, 83 of patients who take more than one medication for their blood pressure have obstructive sleep apnea. 83% of them. So how hard is it for us to find that on our medication list? None. One of the things I really strongly recommend to you guys is to take a complete medication list on patients and actually look at it. You know, a lot of times we gather our health history updates and we really kind of browse over them and, or we let patients tell us no changes and they sign on the bottom. Really, we've got to do better than that. We really need to know what patients are taking because blood pressure medications are a screaming red flag for an airway problem. So let's watch for that. This is a, I love this, this, I, I have a lot of people who just print this out. And anybody who would like a copy of this PowerPoint, if you will email me, I will give you this whole PowerPoint so that you can have all this information. Um, but if you are a standard healthy, healthy person, no family history of heart, heart disease, your odds ratio of having a, a heart attack is super low. But you're seven times more likely if you're overweight 23 times more likely to have a heart attack if you have obstructive sleep apnea than the average person. So th the impact of heart attack and stroke on this because of this disease process is very high. It increases our stroke risk more than any. 80% of nighttime strokes can be directly attributed to obstructive sleep apnea. How many patients have, do we have in our practice who've had stroke? And the sad thing about it is you have a stroke and please, Lord, let us recover from that. But do they send you for a sleep study after you get that done? Does anybody, anybody had a patient who had a TIA or one of those mini strokes? Did they have a sleep study after it to find out? We know it's linked. Why didn't they do a sleep study? So we need to do better with that in identifying these patients. This is a, my favorite poster. This is a poster that we have at the office. But it's just it makes it easy for patients to be able to see and identify themselves in this, this whole scenario. I can get that for you if you want one. Acid reflux. We see patients all the time with those little pitted cusp tips. I mean, it's not an occlusion, so it's not abrasion. It's not a wear pattern. What's it from? So remember the guy in the video when he's choking, those belts on his belly are pulling and pulling and pulling, trying to get air past that obstruction in his airway. So what do you think when that builds up negative pressure? So think of your tongue on the top of that airway like a plunger. He's pulling and pulling. The tongue is creating negative pressure so that when he goes and catches his breath, where do you think all that, all the acid pushes up into his esophagus? So that's where acid reflux at night comes into play. Um, we have to look at patients differently who have acid reflux, who, who are on Prilosec. How many patients do we have a day that are on Prilosec or Nexium or Zantac every day? Those medications are made to be taken for two weeks. Two. And we have patients who take them, literally take them every day of their life. That is not good for us. It's not good for our bones. It's not good for anything. We need stomach acid to digest food. We don't need it to be turned off every day. That's not the purpose of that. So we, patients who are on on medications for acid reflux, we've got to take a look at their airway to see what can be connected with that. And we see kids with those little pits, the children with that acid reflux staining on their teeth. This starts when we're a little bitty. This, doesn't, this isn't something that just appears out of the ceiling. This is a disease that progresses through our whole life. So children are suffering with it as well. So we need to watch that. When that negative pressure builds up, and it doesn't even, they don't even have to have acid brash into their mouth. It could be the gas off-gassing from the acid hit that's risen into the esophagus that burns your teeth. So it's not bulimia. If it's bulimia, we've got a whole bunch of 400-pound bulimics in Arkansas, I'm just saying. So symptoms and of other symptoms include headache. There are a few different headaches that are related to parts of sleep apnea. We know that there's an increased incidence of migraine headache for patients who have sleep apnea. 
when you have those arousals over and over and you're not able to get through your deep sleep, REM sleep cycle, there's some really special stuff that happens to your brain during those cycles, uh, kind of like a washout oil change that occurs in real deep sleep that's really important for brain health. And if you don't get that washout, if that washout can't occur because you're always waking up, that builds up toxins. It builds up proteins in our brain that give us a higher incidence of migraine headache. Um, there's also a headache in the morning. Very often patients have morning headaches from clenching and grinding their teeth at night. We know that, that bruxism in itself has been classified as a sleep-related movement disorder. So we know nighttime bruxism is now strongly related with airway disorder. It's a, it's a medical condition now. It's not just a daytime uh, occlusion problem. It's not stress. At night, it's a sympathetic response to a choking uh, incident. So we know the patient chokes, the body reacts, fires the masseters, bruxes the teeth, saves the airway. So there's a pattern of bruxism at night that goes along with this. So a lot of those patients who clench and grind come in with headaches. We end up seeing a lot of them get diagnosed or misdiagnosed in a way with, with temporomandibular mandibular joint dysfunction where it's not, it's a chicken and the egg thing. Do they have joint pain now because they're clenching and bruxing because they have an airway problem? Or do the airway, it's which happened first? Was it the airway problem that caused them to clench and they have the TMJ or the other way around? So we have to really look at that. And then dull morning headaches in the morning can be often related to low oxygen saturations overnight. So all connected. So patients who are on migraine meds, we want to definitely take a look at them. So this is what we're talking about. These are signs and symptoms that we see in the, in the mouth frequently. And that is the devil a big beefy tongue with scalloping. So scallop tongues, that's imprinted teeth from pressing your teeth against your tongue, your tongue against your teeth all night long, trying to get your tongue out of your airway. So try not to see a scalloped tongue now. Try not to say something about it. You see them all the time. Here's one. Scallop tongue is real common. That imprinting came from somewhere. Push the tongue against the teeth. Big beefy tongues, I call that a two car tongue in a one car garage. So we've got to look for big tongues that don't fit into the mouth. And then abfractions, loss of gingival attachment, brux facets. All of these are signs and symptoms of the clenching and grinding that goes along with airway problems. So when we see this, and bruxism has been re, now that we've reclassified bruxism, what do we do with? flat plane splints. Research now shows that you can take a patient who doesn't have an airway problem and give them an airway problem by putting them in a flat plane splint. So if a patient, if you do beautiful restorations and you want to protect that dentition, we need to build into your system a way for you to make sure that the airway is safe if you're going to do that. So if a patient doesn't have obstructive sleep apnea, voila. They're good for a, an, a flat plane splint, that's fine. But if the patient does have an airway problem, they are not a candidate for a flat, flat plane splint. Research has shown. Um, another risk factor again is uh, big necks. Patients who have large necks, women who have a neck size of 15 and a half inches, men who have neck sizes larger than 17 inches, a uh, high indicator for an airway problem. Big tongues, big necks, big problems. So we have to look beyond the teeth. We see, we see these all the time. I marked my bib clips, because I'm a cheater. My bib clips, tip to tip, is 17 inches. My bib clip, I put a mark at 15 and a half, so when I put my bib clip on, I can actually measure a patient's neck. And if their neck doesn't fit in that clip, I know that I need to look further into the airway to see what the problem is. We're not getting any littler. We know that weight on the airway makes it worse. It doesn't cause this. You're born with this. But putting a whole bunch of weight on a bad airway sure doesn't help any. So we're not getting any littler. So we can pretty much expect in the next 20 years to see 
the diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea increase exponentially. Our awareness is getting better, but our body habitus is getting bigger. So this is kind of a, I'll go through these real quickly so we, I don't want to take too much time on this. But this is trends. This is, this is the CDC's documentation of body habitus. So these are patients or uh, people in the states who have a BMI of 30 or greater. So this starts and just changes in 20 years. Watch. So the dark blue is at 10 to 14 percent. So here we go. 1989, 90, 91. Just about everybody is reporting by 93. Okay? So now we have a new color. 15 to 19 percent obesity. 95, 96. Now we got a new color. In Arkansas, we say thank God for Mississippi. Because if anything's going to be number one for bad stuff, it's going to be them before us. So, anyway, thank God for Mississippi. But you'll see, there's, now we're at 20% of the population being obese. 20. 20. Thank God for Mississippi. 25. Watch it grow. And now we have a new one, 30%. Colorado's still lagging. Marijuana's not legal yet. They'll catch up. So... 30%, greater than 30% of the population is over 30% BMI. That's not good. T 10, so just between 1990 and 2010, we went from a country with a BMI in the 10 to 14% range to a country with BMIs in the 30% range. And it gets worse. That's another, this is 12, 2012. 2013, that, now that's 35%. Thank God for Mississippi. 14, 15. So obesity rates, if they continue on their current rate, by 2030, 13 states will have obesity rates above 60%. All of them could be more than 60. And they say Mississippi, by 2030, could have a, the highest at 66% morbidly obese. So we're not getting any littler. Our lifestyles have changed. We've become more techno uh, a technological world. We don't work in the fields. We don't work out like we used to. So we're not getting any littler. So this problem is not going to go away for a long time. So we all have to get on board to help. So that's a little bit about sleep apnea and what it is. How do we make it work in our practice, though? We can learn. I always say you can't you know, research your way to ride a bicycle. You actually have to be able to do this. You have to get on and pedal. So how can we make this work in our practice? So this protocol really works. It's timed appropriately. It's timed for a reason. So I'm going to go through it real quickly for, with you. It's kind of a six-step protocol where we screen patients, which we're already doing. Then we have the patients return for an airway consultation, independent of the, of the dental chair. I don't want them... I don't want it as an afterthought to hygiene. I want them to come, have their hygiene appointment, and then if they're screened as, as having a high indicator, I want them to come back for an airway screening. Where we can use our technology, that's the echo vision over there, we can use our technology and measure the airway's uh, size in its baseline and in its collapsibility. And if the patient has a really collapsible airway, then help them Either send home a, a sleep monitor if you have them in your office or get them to a, the proper people to get the sleep study done. So screen every patient, then do a consultation where we can gather more information about the patient, their medical insurance information, their medical history, medical conditions that are connected with OSA, measure the airway, and then if they need a sleep study, get that done. Between the time that a patient has a sleep study done and they come back to me to go over that sleep study, I take the time to have, I use a third party biller and I have them verify benefits, find out what the patient's insurance will cover, so because the, the patient's going to want to know that when they come back. So I need that for, for my case presentation. So once I get a sleep study started for a patient, I get busy and get their benefits verified. I have the patient come back and go through a consultation where we actually 
go over what the sleep study means. When you had your sleep study done, Doc, when you had your sleep study done, did they sit down with you and teach you what it meant and go over everything with you, or did you just say you were mild and good luck with that? Well, they were a little bit, Right. One of the things that's really important in this process is to educate our patients, because an educated patient is a powerful patient. So I really encourage us to sit down knee to knee with the patient and really explain what the sleep study means, what it says, how many times did they choke, how low did their oxygen fall, what does that mean for them, how does that work, how does that affect them, so that we can help them not die from that, okay? So we'll go over all that information with the patient, and after that, they're going to want to know how much it costs. So we're going to go over that with them. And then when they're ready, move them straight back to the pharyngometer where we can use our technology to finish measuring the airway, reposition the mandible in different, in different positions so that we can actually take a bite at treatment position with this technology. And then a few weeks later, when the lab's gotten its job done, deliver the appliance. This all has a built, this, the whole protocol has a, the concept of building on education for the patient, building value for the care for the patient so they understand the life-threatening nature of their disease and the need to get it taken care of. And honestly, you guys, none of this protocol is about selling plastic. All of this protocol is about saving patients' lives. Um, I have just as many patients on CPAPs as I do on oral devices. I don't care how you get treatment, I only care that you get treatment. And I, our goal should be that no patient gets missed again. They've been missed by everybody else, and you're looking at what causes it. So we have to say something to these patients. And regardless of whether or not you want to get involved and do oral appliance therapy, at a minimum, the American Dental Association is now Make, made their statement that says that we should be screening all of our patients, children and adults, for sleep-related breathing disorders. We should be screening them. It is our job. We're working closest to the airway. There's no one who looks down the hole more than we do. Anybody ever go to their doctor and they don't even look, they don't even look in your mouth anymore? You don't get the whole uh, say I uh, thing. But we're doing it all day long, so we are the people who are looking at the airway to make sure these patients are safe. So number one, just screen your patients. And it can be as simple as some, a few basic questions about snoring and being tired, checking their medication list, looking at their health history. If they've got diabetes and hypertension, if, how many of our patients are on two blood pressure meds and metformin? We see it every day. Of those patients, two blood, pressure two blood pressure medications and metformin, 95% of those patients have obstructive sleep apnea. 95% of them. We can't just not understand that and help them know it because they don't know. No one's ever said anything to them about it. Unfortunately, our medical world these days is really good at putting Band-Aids on and not fixing problems. And we, they make pharmacy companies make customers, they don't make cures. So we need to do better than that, and we can. We have the power in our, in our offices. So make a goal to screen every patient. And at its minimum, make sure to ask them if they snore. You'll get the deer in the headlights look the for, for a few times. Why are you asking me that? Well, because I see signs in your airway. You know, your tongue is huge, yeah, huge. Or I, you know, have you noticed that you have these marks on your tongue from your teeth? That's not normal, and it makes me worried that you can't breathe and sleep at the same time. So it's really important to, you know, if you snore when you sleep, sometimes patients will say, well, I don't know, you have to ask my wife. Well, okay, I will. You know, there are really good apps now for your phone. One of them is called SnoreLab. A lot of patients, when I'm screening them, say, I'm not really sure. Like, I'm single. My dogs won't tell on me. So... Snore Lab is an app that you can turn on at night and put on your nightstand, and it will record on your phone all night long what's going on when you're sleeping. So if patients don't know, they need to become aware that snoring is bad. It's not just funny. It's not just annoying. Do you know that the number two cause of divorce in America, number one, 
money. Number two is snoring. And number three is infidelity. Snoring pe um, partners tend to sleep on opposite sides of the house. And it breaks people up. There's marriages all over who are destroyed because of they can't sleep with their bed partner. So screen, screen, screen. Ask the questions. I don't care in what order you do, but please don't let patients suffer without missing, without talking to them about it. This is a screener that insurance companies love. It's called the Epworth Sleepiness Scale. And it is a scale that is a subjective scale. Of, on, a, on zero to three, how likely are you to become tired in these situations? How likely, in a scale of zero to three, are you to become tired if you're sitting and reading a book? I'm a three. How about sitting and watching TV? How like you, would you get drowsy if you were sitting down in the evening and watching TV? Zero to three. How likely are you to do it if you're riding in a car as a passenger, you know, for more than an hour? I'm a three. So the information about this is, for patients who score 11 or more points on this score, the Epworth sleepiness score, if you score 11 or more, you're considered excessively sleepy, okay? So a really easy screener for patients to take. It's on my health history intake. I have in my intake forms for my patients, we have all our standard HIPAA, patients demographics, health history, medication lists. The last page in my screener is a uh, form that looks just like this. It's actually this form. This is the Watermark Aries screener, and it has the Epworth sleepiness score in the middle of it. It has health health problems that are related to airway, and then it has some questions about snoring. All my patients get this for every, every, every intake. And this is my uh, annual health update with a medication list as well. So we just have to screen them. Which as you can make it as, as big or as little as you want, but please, at a minimum, on your health history intake that you're already using, if you'll add questions like, do you snore when you sleep? Have you been diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea? Do you wear a CPAP? Just some questions to open a conversation so that it begins to become a normal way of screening for patients. They may not understand it the first time you see them, but they'll get it the second time you see them because then it's normal, okay? So don't miss screening patients. Bed partners are super important. Like I said earlier, there's nobody who can help us better than a bed partner um, to know does your partner choke and, and do they stop breathing? Do they move around a lot at night? How many times do they have to get up and go to the bathroom? Important information that you wouldn't know otherwise. Also, for parents and children, does your child spin in the bed? Do they wet the bed? Does your child snore when they sleep? Bed partner or sleep observer scales are really important. So I have the sleep group solution system has every form you could think of. And they're in a portal, all in Word document format so that when you become a sleep group's partner, you get them all. And then you can, because they're in Word format, you just put them on your letterhead and make them your own, edit them, do whatever you want to with them. So we have all these available for you. But it's really important to have the bed partner involved because this affects both of them. There's, remember when I said that it was not just the choking that's bad, the oxygen saturation, that kills you, that's bad. But the fact that you have to wake up all the time destroys your hormones. Well, when you wake up your bed partner all the time, they're having the arousals too. So it's a secondhand obstructive sleep apnea that they get. So it's really important to take care of both of the bed partners at the same time. Doesn't that guy look really rich? You're with me? He looks rich, doesn't he? Just saying. You know what I mean. Um, this is a really good one. This is a this is a patient of my, my friends, and I love this one because it was a patient who says, I have no idea if I snore or not. You have to ask my wife. I, I, I don't know. So we asked his wife. She filled it out, and he, she said, yes, he, he falls asleep all the time. He falls asleep while he's driving. He falls asleep when the kids are playing ball. He falls asleep at every family function. He screams. He shakes his head. He moves around, and it happens every single night. How does he not know he snores? So... She definitely threw him under the bus. We got him, we, we were able to help him, so that's good. This is a screener for hygiene. This is so important. This is the Malampati score. Dr. Malampati is an anesthesiologist, and he uh, created this screening 
to help him determine how hard it was going to be to intubate somebody. And it works great for us. It's really medical grade documentation of the size of the tongue. And it's a north to south measurement of the base of the tongue to the hard palate. So Dr. Malampati would say, stick out your tongue. Let me see if I can see your tush. Tongue, uvula, soft palate, hard palate. And the patient just sticks their tongue out. And you look straight back at the posterior oropharynx. It's not ah. It's open your mouth, stick your tongue out. So north to south. Base of the tongue, hard palate. So if you can see all of it, uvula, soft palate, hard palate, the whole uvula, the base of the tongue's thin, that's an easy intubation. That is not a patient with an airway problem. You drop a crown on that patient, nothing but net. This patient, you've got the uvula a little obstructed, but I can still see really clearly back. So the base of the tongue is a little thicker. The soft palate sags a little bit, but I can still see the posterior oropharynx. I don't really worry about that patient either. It's these two where we have airway problems. So base of the tongue completely hides the uvula, so the, so the uvula sags down below. That's not good. And four is when the base of the tongue, all you can see is the hard palate. So tongue, hard palate, can't breathe. Tongue, soft palate, hard palate, can't breathe. These you can breathe, these you can't. So that's an easy screener. If a patient has a melampotty three or four, they can't breathe when they sleep. There's no hole for them to breathe when, when they're sitting up. Ever had that patient and you lay them back and they're like, nope, 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 that's a, 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 no farther, no farther, I can't breathe. Or you lay the patient back and suddenly their tongue takes on a whole different life and you wish you had an extra assistant. They call it the Moses tongue because you have one patient, you know, one assistant pull the tongue, one assistant pull the cheek, and you go like Moses down the middle to try to get your work done. That's a tongue that's killing that. That tongue is literally killing them every night. We have to say something about that. Two-car tongue, one-car garage. Got to have more room than that. Any patients with four bicuspid ortho extractions? They've taken out 11 millimeters of tooth, but they haven't taken out 11 millimeters of tongue. We have to be really aware that those patients maybe have compromised airways because of that. So let's watch that. So we see this all the time, great big tongues folded in the middle, trying to fit into a dental arch. Can you see around me? Covers the occlusal surfaces, that's no good. Scallop tongue. Look at the Brux facets. Can you see those? Scallop tongue. That tongue's worked all night long trying to get out of his airway. Pharyngometry truly lets us measure the airway in real time. It lets us see what the airway does and how it responds to, to airway changes, to air changes and pressure changes in the airway. Uh, Rutgers has done a recent study on this technology that really proved its... Um, validity for, for measuring airway uh, when comparing it to CBCT. It measures exactly the same. It's highly reproducible and there's no radiation. It uses sound, so it doesn't hurt anybody. It measures not only the lower airway, but with rhinometry, the nasal airway, so that we can see if a patient can breathe through their nose. And if they can't breathe through their nose, where's the problem? And then again, if you can breathe through your mouth, and if it's obstructed, where does the obstruction occur? It's really important in our therapy. So once we've screened our patients, the final step in screening has got to be a sleep study. This is a medical condition. We cannot make an oral appliance without a patient having had a sleep study done and a prescription for our oral appliance from, from a physician. A sleep study has to be read by a board-certified sleep MD. Any MD that treats the patient can give us permission to make an oral appliance based on the results of that sleep study. So the advent of home monitors has been wonderful for the dental field because we are allowed in our offices to, to have home monitors like the Aries watermark units that patients can actually take home from our offices, get a sleep study done in their own bedrooms, in their own beds, bring it back to us, we, have, we can upload it to a portal where a board-certified sleep MD will read it in California. 
and give us an interpretation and then give us some recommendations for the patient's care and give us a prescription for that, for oral appliance and CPAP and all the things that he feels that is necessary for the patient. So the advent of the home monitor has been practice changing for dentists because we, it puts us in control of patients. We don't lose patients because we don't have to send them out. They can actually go home from our office. Super handy. The Aries monitors are state-of-the-art monitors. Uh, they're the same monitors most hospitals have, um, but they do test every lead that's necessary to, to determine whether a patient's choking and suffocating when they're breathing. The sleep study looks like this. Remember what the AHI is, the apnea hypopnea index? That's how many times a patient chokes per hour. So it gives us a score called the AHI that's 14. This patient, that would be mild, but here's another score that it gives us. We didn't really talk about this. The other scoring system's called the RDI. So apneas and hypopneas aren't the only kind of choking event. Each of those events has to be 10 seconds long, but there's another choking event called a RERA a respiratory effort related arousal. It makes you wake up. It just doesn't jump the insurance hoops. So what happens if you only choke for nine seconds? Insurance doesn't count it. But you still had to wake up and you almost died from it, so it, it's important. So any of the choking events that cause you to wake up, but don't quite break the threshold of what insurance considers an apnea or a hypo a hypopnea is considered a RERA respiratory effort-related arousal. So when we add those into the mix, apneas, hypopneas, and reras divided by the time that we slept, the scoring system is called the Respiratory Disturbance Index, or the RDI. So we use both of those. So I bill the insurance by that number, but I treat the patient by that number, because the RDI actually signifies all of the choking events. I, don't, I wanna treat all of the events. I don't, it's not just the ones the insurance pays for. Okay, so with the Aries watermark units, we can get a diagnosis for the patient. This patient has modern positional, moderate positional obstructive sleep apnea and a prescription for an oral appliance in the recommendations for care. It says mandibular repositioning splint, code E0486 for a diagnosis of OSA, G47.33, is demonstrated by the study re results. That's recommendations or prescription, a letter of medical necessity for an oral device. So with home monitors now, it's become easier and easier and easier for us to screen and help patients move all the way through this protocol without having a whole bunch of extra hoops to jump through or other time-consuming ways of getting them screened. It's so much faster just to send them home with ours. So when we get a sleep study done, what do we do with the patient? So this is how the protocol works. The AASM, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, in 2015 changed their practice parameters to say this. For patients who have mild to moderate sleep apnea, that oral appliances should be the first line therapy. So for patients who have mild to moderate, we're gonna get a diagnosis and get a prescription for the patient's care from our office we're gonna pre-authorize the oral appliance with the insurance company. Because these devices cost more than $1,000, insurance companies require that they be pre-authorized if we're going to bill for them. So that's that little break between getting the sleep study done. So we do our pre-authorization, have the patient return so we can go over the sleep studies with them and then do a case presentation to let them know what their insurance coverage is gonna be, and then make our diagnostic records use our nerpharyngometry to find our bite, and then deliver the appliance. Straight down the protocol. That is our protocol one by one. Diagnosis, go over the diagnosis with the patient, uh, do our records, and uh, deliver the appliance. If they are severe, and you will find patients in your practice with life-threatening, super severe obstructive sleep apnea who have no idea they have it. Scary. But if you have a patient that you find to be severe, I always ask them, would you please, can I please set you up to go over and see the sleep doc and try a CPAP for me? Give me a good 60 day Girl Scout or Boy Scout try, please try it. And if they say, sure, then I'm gonna make a phone call, send them to the sleep lab and let the sleep, uh, sleep lab issue them a, a CPAP to try. If they say, no, there's no way I'll ever wear it, then they become 
just like all the other people. The practice parameters say for patients who have severe sleep apnea, who cannot or will not use a CPAP, then we're going to treat them just like oral appliances, and oral appliances can be first-line therapy for them as well. So it's really the patient's choice. I strongly push them when they're, when they're severe to at least try it, but if they don't want to try it, for whatever reason, they don't have to anymore. They can go straight to oral appliance therapy. Um, we just need to get a form that says, my dentist told me about CPAP, I don't want it. Sign it, it's called a CPAP intolerance or refusal form. They sign that, insurance will cover them just like mild or moderate as well. So we have those forms for you as well. So this is rhinometry. Rhinometry measures the nose. So it measures everything from the, from the opening of the nair through the nasal valve, anterior and posterior turbinates to the back of the nasopharynx. We need to be able to know whether a patient can breathe through their nose. If they can't breathe through their nose, it may impact the way that an oral device works for them. If they can't breathe through their nose, they definitely can't wear a CPAP because that's where the air goes. So it's important to know whether a patient has the ability to breathe and move air through their nose. Um, if they can't, then I may down the road get C ENT to help me to see what we can do to help encourage them to breathe or help, help rehabilitate them so that they can breathe through their nose, whether that be th surgically or therapeutically. Um, but being able to breathe through our nose is important. Pharyngometry measures everything from the incisors down the airway past the glottis. The airway, the area of the airway that we can actually affect with an oral appliance is from the soft palate to the glottis. So we need to be able to measure that area and see if it is collapsible or not. Uh, an airway that is really collapsible can lend itself to apnea. It's not diagnostic, but it's highly predictive of an airway issue. So being able to quantify that's very important. Um, it allows us to, to uh, predictably know that, if re that whether repositioning is gonna work for a patient or not. So if a patient has a highly collapsible airway and I can't reposition them to a point where they're not collapsible anymore, then probably won't be using a, an oral device on them. It gives me an idea ahead of therapy whether the therapy will be successful or not. Pretty handy to know. I had a patient who came into the practice. <coughs> excuse me. I had a patient who came into the practice in Miami, and he had been at his dentist every two weeks for seven months in an oral device. Every two weeks. Excuse me. Um, and it wasn't working. And he was as protruded. They had moved him with the mechanics in it as far forward as they could get him in it. He couldn't, he couldn't go far, any further. And it still wasn't working. And now he couldn't close. Now he had a lovely open posterior bite on both sides. And he couldn't close his teeth. He'd moved now to complete edge to edge. And he had headaches and his joints hurt, and he was miserable. But he couldn't wear CPAP, and he has really bad sleep apnea, severe sleep apnea. Couldn't wear CPAP. What, is he, what are we supposed to do? So he brings me his oral appliance and says, I heard you have that thing. Can you fix it? I said, well, I don't know if I can or not, but I'll sure give it a shot. So I put him on the pharyngometer and began to measure him. Um, his dentist had made it in the standard way that oral appliances have always been made. George Gage, 50% of protrusive, that's where we start and then start moving them forward. That's kind of, we, we've, until we had these, a way to see what we're doing, we always just kind of guessed at position, hoped we didn't kill him. So he had started there and he had moved him forward every two weeks. Started him in position, how you doing? Is that good? You good? Fine. You still snoring? Yep, still snoring. Move, move him forward. Let him go home, let him sleep, come back in two weeks. How you doing? You sleeping any better? You still snoring? Yep, still snoring. Move you forward. So he'd done that over and over and over until he just couldn't go out any further. But he wasn't any better. So I put him on the pharyngometer, and I, he had a horrible airway. His airway collapsed down to less than a half of a centimeter square. So less than a drinking straw is how small his airway got when he was breathing out. 
I repositioned him in all different varieties, all different verticals, uh, opened him way up, pushed him forward. Nothing changed his airway at all. None. I did a comb beam. He's got a huge adenoid pad. He's got super redundant tissue. He's got kissing tonsils in the posterior. There, I couldn't have, there, it was not an appropriate therapy for him. No position in it for his mandible would have opened his airway. And I knew that before I made it. So I had to tell him, I can't fix your oral appliance because you shouldn't have an oral appliance. It's not the best therapy for you. It's, I don't think that this is ever going to work for you. And he said, why didn't my dentist tell me that? So, well, your dentist didn't have that technology. That's new. He did it the way we've always done it. He said, well, that doesn't work for me. And I said, well, I, you need to have a CPAP. That's all there is to it. And I'm going to refer you to an ENT because I think you need to do some work. Maybe we need those tonsils to go. And he was really angry, really angry. And guess what he did for a living? He was a malpractice attorney. The last person I want in my chair is a malpractice attorney if I don't measure what I'm doing. So, yeah, measuring is important. So that's what the pharyngometer does. It measures everything, measures the airway and its collapsibility, gives me predictability as to whether the therapy is going to work, gives me so I can have honest conversations with peri I never have to say to a patient, well, we'll start here and see how it works. It's their airway. I don't want to guess at your airway. So it allows me to really see what I'm doing. So that's what the pharyngometer does. We use these airway metrics jigs. They're little um, try-ins, oral appliance try-ins, in all different vertical dimensions. We have learned in the last several years the importance of the vertical component in oral appliances. It's not just a one-size-fits-all. Before, before we understand the value of the two-dimensional airway, because our airway's not, our airway's three-dimensional. It's not just a trombone. Um, the way we really made oral appliances is kind of like all of us going to the shoe store, but they only sell a size seven, the average size. We always started everybody at an average position. So you get a, go to the shoe store, everybody gets a size 7. Some of us, it'll fit, and they'll work great. But some of them, it's going to be way too big. Some of them, it's going to be way too little. So you get to come back to the shoe store every two weeks and get another size. And you have to wear it for two weeks before you decide whether it fits or not. And then you can come back in two weeks, and we'll give you another size. And we keep trying it in that. That's not the way we need to be doing somebody's airway. So airway metrics jigs lets us do all the try-ins up front so that we can actually see how the airway responds to the position so that we can determine whether that or not that position is going to be effective in stabilizing a collapsible airway. Oral appliances don't make your airway bigger. They keep your airway from collapsing. So we need to be able to quantify that and actually try to collapse the airway in different positions to see when the collapse stops and have a way to measure that. And that's what this technology allows us to do. We can really hone in that price. Good elbow catch. So let's talk a minute about oral appliances. How are we doing? Oh, we're doing good. Talk real quickly about oral appliances. There are over 100 oral appliances on the market. Uh, every single oral appliance, regardless of what it looks like, does exactly the same thing. So a lot of dentists ask me, well, what's the best oral appliance? Which one do you use? What's the best one? There is no best one. It's the one that works best in your hands that the patient will wear and that works to open the airway. So it doesn't, they all do the same thing. They all open the airway, maintain its position, so it's a mechanical stent to maintain the position so the patient can breathe. So let's go through a few of them so you can see what they look like. The most, these are some of the most common oral devices out. This is the dorsal fin appliance. It comes in two pieces. So for patients with mobility problems or patients who have, have um, joint problems, it's easy to put one piece in at a time. They're held forward by a fin that w has mechanics on the side so that you can titration titrate these um, this appliance forward so 
If you turn the little screw there, it moves that monoblock forward, catches the fin, and, and adds protruso. You can make it in any vertical that you need. It's a reasonable price. It's a good appliance. Very, very popular. Not for patients who brux. There's no lateral movement in this appliance. So if a patient doesn't brux, needs good airway control, it's a good oral appliance at a reasonable price. This is the Prosomnus. It's one of the high-tech appliances that have really come out in the last few years. We've always made appliances out of uh, acrylic, which works. I mean, acrylic's great. We can all work with it. It's easy to change with a handpiece. But recently, Prosomnus has begun milling these, their oral devices out of PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate acrylic, a real high-pressured, very non-porous um, acrylic. It's a beautiful appliance. And because it's so low, its porosity is so low, it doesn't get biogunk. So you don't get the acrylic funk that you usually get with stuff. So it's a really pretty appliance. It looks like that all the time. They make dorsal, a dorsal fin model of it, and then they make an also what's called a Herbst appliance. But this, this is kind of the way oral devices are going now. More and more they're being milled out of PMMA acrylic so that we can have a higher quality, uh, lower residue oral appliance. Really super, super cool. This is the Herbst, one of the most common, probably 40, 50% of my appliances made are this Herbst appliance. The Herbst appliance, just like anybody who's done ortho forever, that's a Herbst rod that we used for growing bone in, in ortho. So the Herbst appliance is uh, one of the Medicare approved appliances. Medicare does cover oral appliance therapy. They were actually the first to cover it. They were the first to approve home monitors. Medicare has been a real leader in the way we do this. But they're kind of got a closed circle of care. So they want everything kind of done their way. So Medicare just has two or three appliances that they have approved for use. The Herbst is one of those. Medicare says that until this year, they've always had to be hinged with metal. So uh, this is a really good appliance. It's very forgiving, great for uh, patients who brux, lots of lateral movement, so and very, very fine micro adjustability. One turn of the turnbuckle on a Herbst appliance is a sixteenth of a millimeter. So it takes 16 turns just to move a millimeter. So using pharyngometry, you can literally fine tune it into just the perfect airway. Half a millimeter on an airway can make a real dramatic difference in the way the airway responds. So being able to change it like that is very important. But super nice, nice price, lots of companies make it. The Herbst appliance is a beautiful, easy, forgiving appliance. Uh, this is the Narval. Let me see if I've got the Panthera. This Pan Narval went back to France, so I'm going to skip that. Um, Panthera is made in Canada. It is also one of the most popular appliances in the country right now. It is a, th a uh, milled nylon appliance. It is super strong and paper thin. For patients who have very low tolerance of having anything in their mouth, it, it weighs probably... Ounce, just barely ounces, maybe two ounces. It is so, so, so lightweight and paper thin and indestructible. It is, you can basically run it over with your car. Your dog still can eat it. Ask me how I know that. But it is really tough. It has a really high, high warranty. Um, it's not for patients who need any dental work done. Uh, you can't adjust it. You can't, like, open it up with a hand piece. You can't reline it. It has to be made on teeth that are ready to go. So if a patient needs a lot of dental work, you'd want to stick with an appliance that was acrylic so that you could reline it. This you cannot, but it is little, and it is fan it's the Cadillac of all the appliances right now. You use these little rods on the side. It comes with a whole pack of different lengths of these side arms, and you swap the side arm out to change the position of the mandible. Um, occlusal changes can occur in oral appliance therapy. Yeah, they can. Um, in order for us to try to minimize occlusal changes for patients, um, one of the really important things that we do is create a morning aligner. 
So when the patient takes that appliance out, because they've been held in an, in an abnormal position all night, we use a little key to help them regain posterior occlusion. So when they take their appliance out in the morning, brush their teeth, eat breakfast, get up, drink a cup of coffee, do what you're doing, get ready for work. And then after 30 minutes to an hour, if, if your bite isn't back on your posteriors, then you can use this little key to help flush the fluid out of the joint and stretch the muscle. The pterygoid gets really tight when you're held forward like that. So it helps flush that, stretch the pterygoid, and regain your posterior occlusion. Occlusion can, bite, bite changes can happen. They can. We have to be okay with understanding that airway trumps everything. And we're dentists. So if a bite change occurs, that's what ortho's for. So we have to be aware that we're going to do everything we can to minimize bite changes by making a good, well-fitting oral appliance in the proper position. We're going to wrap all the teeth. The, the, the clear appliance, that PMMA appliance, uh, they've done research on that material. And if you wrap all the teeth in that material, capture the posterior molar, they are more retentive than Essex retainers are. So retention is really good if we make sure that we do our technique right. So we're going to use a really good technique to make sure that we, we get the least tooth movement that we can. We're going to instruct the patient how to do morning exercises and use our morning aligner so that we make sure that we get back into posterior occlusion. Have I had bite changes occur? Yes, I have. I have patients who are not compliant with wearing that morning aligner. Most of the times they don't, most of the patients who've, who I have had, and I've had a few, um, probably 10. I've been doing this eight years. I've, I've had about 10 patients who've had open posterior bites. And most of them don't even realize they have it. They feel better, they still eat and chew and have no problem with anything else, but I know it. And so I put them in Invisalign to regain their bite. But as a rule, patients don't mind. If they do, we need to know that and we need to make sure. And I always have really good informed consent with my patients before I send them home in an oral device so that they understand. It's my job to open your airway. It's your job to get your bite back in the morning, every morning. So it's really important that they understand that. But they can change and I'm really honest with patients that, that it's a problem. You just have to stop thinking like a dentist. I, I always call it TSD, that's so dentist. Every time someone worries about something that really isn't as important as it seems to be, I always say it's because we're dentists and we worry about everything. We do worry about everything and we're perfectionists in this field. And we have to understand that perfection's not always the same in medical versus dental. The medical field is kind of like hand grenades, sometimes close is good enough, you know? For us, that's really hard for us to tolerate. So we have to understand that there's some give and take in airway care for patients. That airway, regardless of anything, if a patient can't breathe, nothing else matters. With unopened bites, we're better than an open casket. I've never had a patient with an anterior open bite like that, P.S., ever. But it is true. We have to understand that breathing trumps everything. That's the morning aligner that I was talking about. This one's made by Great Lakes Orthodontics. It's about five bucks a piece. Um, when you deliver your oral appliance before they go home and sleep in it, this is a little wafer of, of like thermocurl. You warm it up, it gets real floppy. You have the patient bite in their habitual bite and mold it like a little hat. Let it cool and there's your key for them to go home and sleep in, in, in the morning, use that every morning. So Great Lakes Orthodontics make them. Most of the labs now actually will send one with each case because it is important that we do this key to make sure these patients get back. But Great Lakes Orthodontics is super. You can buy a whole box of them for like 60 bucks. So the key helps them get back in place. So now we've talked about screening, we've talked about how to measure, we've talked about oral devices, how to, but all that's good if none of it works if we don't get paid for it. Everything that we do here is 
billed to their medical insurance, all of it. The pharyngometry, the rhinometry, the screenings, the office visits, the oral device, the Panorex, all the, that we do, the philosophy of medicine, if they come in the building, everything after a positive sleep study is a billable office visit in the office. So you have to think differently than dentists. So let's put our dental hat. Here's our dentist hat. Patient comes in with broken tooth. We're going to we're, we're going to prep them for a crown. So what are we going to charge them for? So they're there. So it's going to be an emergency office visit, and then maybe a PA, uh, maybe a post or build up and a crown prep. We're going to build for all that, right? And then in two weeks, when they come back to crowns back, we're going to seat the crown. What do we charge them for? Nothing. And then two days later, when the bite's a little bit high and now they hurt, we have them come back and we adjust the occlusion a little bit for them. What do we charge for? Nothing. And if you live in Miami, they're going to come back in two weeks and go, eh, the color is not exactly like I liked it. And we're going to redo it. And what are we going to charge them for? Nothing. Right? Okay. That's not how medicine works. We screen our patients in hygiene. We help them get identified, and we get the sleep study done. The minute that doctor signs that sleep study, that the patient is positive for obstructive sleep apnea, game on. We change philosophies altogether. They become a medical patient in your office. So what happens to you every time you go to your medical doctor besides the fact that they make you wait two hours in the lobby? What do they do? They take your blood pressure and they weigh you and they take care of you, right? Okay, so when they come to your office at, after the sleep study is positive and they come back to you to talk to you about the sleep study, that's an office visit. If they come in the building and breathe, you bill. So they're going to come into the office, you're going to bill for that office visit. You're going to weigh them. I have scales in my bathroom. They're named Satan. So Satan is in the bathroom. You have to go visit Satan. Tell me what the number says. I write that down. I take your blood pressure, just like at your doctor's office. So weight, blood pressure, that's an office visit. So at that visit, I'm going to do a Panorex. I'm going to go over your sleep study with you. I'm going to do my impressions. I'm going to do all that office visit. So it's billed by the amount of time that I spent with you. That's an office visit. When you come back in three weeks to get your oral appliance, that's an office visit. I'm going to charge for the oral appliance when I insert it. If I use my technology, I'm going to bill for that too. And then I'm going to see you back in about a week to make sure that you're okay. And that's an office visit. And I'm going to bill for that. And if I use the technology, I'm going to bill for that too. Everything past a positive sleep study in the medical world is a billable service. Everything. So that's the difference between medical and dental. There's nothing free in medicine. We don't give, we don't give rebates. We don't, and if your appliance doesn't work, you don't get your money back either. If you, go to your, if you go to your medical doctor and you have knee surgery done, but your knee still hurts when you're done, do you get your money back? No. But we give money back all the time in the dental world. So it's going to be treated a little bit different. That's where the profit, center, the profit center is much different in treating medical in your office than it is in treating dental. It's a lot higher. So medical insurance does pay this. So important things that we have to do. We have to get a sleep study. That's positive for obstructive sleep apnea. We need to get the CPAP intolerance form or refusal form that says, my dentist told me I need it or I could use it, but I don't want it. So we have to get the documentation. We have to have a prescription from a doctor that says we could make them an oral appliance. CPAP intolerance form, get the pre-authorization with an insurance company to make the oral appliance, and then we're going to bill an ideal fee just like the MDs do. In medical versus dental, 
we never know what the allowable is. We don't, you know how in dental we know they'll pay X number of dollars for one surface and then this many dollars for two surfaces and they, we know how many, much they'll pay specifically for a crown. You never know that in medical, ever. They'll never tell you the of what that you don't know. So we have to estimate a lot. And in order to maximize what they will pay, we all bill an ideal fee. So the average ideal fee for an oral device in the United States is about $6,500 to $7,000. Um, when the insurance company gets that number, they automatically cut it in half, and that's where their allowable starts. So in order to maximize their allowable, we all bill at least $6,500 to $7,000 for the appliance, plus the office visits, plus the pharyngometer, plus the everything else. Okay? So Medicare does pay for this. Medicare does cover oral appliances, and they pay for it by region. I'm in the South, where they obviously think we don't need any help because they only pay about $900 in the South. You guys being here in California are in the $1,500 to $1,800 zone for oral appliance therapy from Medicare. That's kind of handy. So documentation is really important. We have to have in the chart the current diagnosis of OSA. It's kind of hard to see. Current diagnosis of OSA, G47.33, and a prescription for an oral appliance, the CPAP intolerance form, the Aries screening form, because it has that Epworth sleepiness scale in it. Copies of any communications. Anytime a doctor writes us or we write a doctor, we need to have that in their patient's chart. And then, of course, our clinical exams and notes. Typical codes and billing for uh, a typical case include your consultation. Uh, your fee's about $200. You're going to get about um, $50 to $100. Uh, your extended office visit, that's the day that we make uh, the, our impressions and use our pharyngometer. The long appointment when we're going over the sleep study, uh, we bill about $250 for that. You're going to get it between $100 and $200. You do bill your Panorex to medical, not to dental. doesn't matter if a patient had an, a pan last year. You're going to repeat a pan this year for their medical chart, not their dental chart. And uh, they'll pay for that the pharyngometer and the rhinometer, the oral device itself, and then your home monitors, your sleep tests can be billed uh, when you're following up this sleep study, when you're following up the oral appliance. After you create an oral appliance, uh, no more than about eight or 10 weeks later, uh, I'm gonna do a repeat homes test with the oral appliance in place to make sure that it's working. That is also a billable service. So if I use my monitors, I'm going to bill for that. So these are all the kind of, the average income for a per case is, is uh, usually $2,400 to, my, my highest is about $6,500 per case. So it varies across the country. Um, you guys are in an area where there's a lot of military, and TRICARE pays 100% of whatever you bill. Um, I live outside Fort Chaffee in Arkansas, so TRICARE in and of itself for active duty, uh, active duty, they really take care of their service people and they pay whatever you bill for your device. So they're the easiest of all. I, I really love taking care of our service people. Um, they love oral appliance therapy because you can travel with it and you can pack it out. It doesn't require any electricity. So the military has strongly, strongly moved toward oral appliances, which is fantastic for our service people. And you guys are in a great place for it, for sure, with the Coast Guard just down the road. But yes, they do pay for it. Don't submit low fees. Make sure that you submit a fee that when they divide that in half, it gives you enough coverage to make sure that your uh, allowable is, is high enough to use the patient's insurance appropriately. If you bill 100% of what you expect to get, you're going to lose money. So you're always going to bill double what you expect to get. Um, all of the fees, again, are billable. That's an office visit and pharyngometry and rhinometry. Um, they do, insurance companies do pay for these. That's a $7,600 case, paid at $4,485. That's a little over a year old. $7,045. So insurances cover them. That's an oral device and an office visit. That's a $5,200 check. So. You know, if you bill it and, and bill it appropriately, 
Insurance companies do pay for this. That's payment on pharyngometry and rhinometry. This technology isn't a, a piece of dental equipment. This is a piece of medical equipment. So the use of it is a billable service. It has its own procedure codes. So every time you use it on a patient, you bill for it. So that's a handy part of it. Again, Anthem, Blue Cross Blue Shield, all sorts of ways. So goals uh, for us tonight, I did pretty good, yes. Um, our goals, please screen your patients. Um, regardless of, of whether you wanna jump in feet first and really get busy with helping patients with oral appliances, I hope you do, eventually at least, but please screen your patients. Um, please help get them to a place where they can have a sleep study um, at your local hospital in the area. Please don't let them suffer. If you see signs and symptoms, patients who have high blood pressure and diabetes and children who have ADD, and we know 70% of children who have ADD have OSA. We've been actually speeding up these sleepy kids, not sl slowing down busy kids. So this is a problem for kids. If you see the signs and symptoms, please don't just ignore them anymore. I hope that this has helped you see a little bit more about what we're already looking at every day and how we can have a real impact on our patients' overall health, not just their pretty teeth. You'll be a better dentist and your dentistry will be better and last longer if you treatment plan with the airway in mind. That, that's so important. Um, you guys are the first line for health care. I want to invite you guys. We teach, uh, I teach seminars all over the country, but I teach in San Francisco um, a couple of times a year, L.A. a couple of times a year. I was just in San Diego. Um, there's one in Portland, Oregon in a couple of weeks. Um, I'd love to invite you guys. We have 16 CE courses all over the country. Um, so anytime that, uh, that you can, if you'll go to sleepgroupsolutions.com, um, there's a whole list of seminars that are available. If you're interested in learning more about obstructive sleep apnea, um, I'd love to see you guys at a seminar. I teach, my son teaches now. Uh, he teaches from his experience as a patient who, who a dentist helped. Um, and I teach from the other side of the chair of that person. So um, I'd love to see you guys there. If you can't make it to seminars, if you, if you would prefer someone come up to your office and help teach your team, I'll do that too. I, this is really important to me, and, and whatever I can do to help you and your team be successful in this, all you have to do is ask me. I'm glad to do that. Thank you for sharing a couple of hours of your time with me uh, this weekend. I'm going to uh, turn on this pharyngometer if anybody wants to see how it works. I'll do a quick demonstration. You, I can't put it on the overhead screen, so if you want to just stand right up here for a few minutes and let me show you how this pharyngometer works, I'll be happy to, and I, I thank you. Come on, Doc, say your piece. <laughs> thank you very thank much, you Rebecca. So much. That was very informative. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, we, uh, we have, our, as usual, the CE credits for you out in, uh, on the table where you signed in, so please uh, be sure to pick it up. If uh, you, you didn't have a, a printed name badge, just come see me, and I have a one-size-fits-all for you. Uh, and I appreciate you all for coming, and we look forward to our other events uh, coming up. Uh, uh, there's uh, flyers on the table on that as well. Thank you.